In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. Today, we are celebrating the memory of our venerable and righteous mother, Mary of Egypt, whose life is one of the most beautiful readings that we read during Great Lent. Those of you who were here on Wednesday would have heard the reading. I've stumbled on a number of abbreviated versions of her life, and none of it comes close to the complete life that we read that's recorded by St. Sophronios of Jerusalem. I encourage you with all my heart that when you go home to find some time to read this if you haven't read the, read the life of St. Mary of Egypt. It's not a short read. It'll take you a good half hour or so to go through the reading. And maybe after that, you may want to spend about another half hour in silence. It's, it's a very powerful witness to Christian living. So I decided not to try to summarize her life, but I'm going to try to quote a few passages uh, from what she shared with St. Zosimas. St. Zosimas is the priest monk who encountered her in the desert and who, after her passing to eternal life, he shared her life story with the monks in the monastery and it was, and it continued to be passed on as an oral tradition until Saint Sophronios uh, wrote it down for our benefit. Saint Mary's life is a wonderful witness to how God's grace and the prayers of the Theotokos can help someone overcome even the most difficult of temptations and the strongest of addictions and to turn their life around. This woman lived as a harlot for 17 years, starting at the age of 12. She explains, when she's talking to Saint Zosimas, she explains that she didn't do this for the money or to earn a living. At some point she says, I was like a fire of public debauch, and it was not for the sake of gain. Often when they, the people she was entertaining, often when they wished to pay me, I refused the money. I acted in this way so as to make as many men as possible to try to obtain me doing free of charge what gave me pleasure. Do not think that I was rich and that was the reason why I did not take money. I lived by begging, often by spinning flax, but I had an insatiable desire and irrepressible passion for, the lying, for lying in filth. This was life to me, every kind of abuse, of nature I regarded as life. This is how I lived. Now see how God's grace works in the heart of such a person. After she had a strange experience that prevented her from entering into the church, she stood weeping before the icon of the Mother of God this woman who lived this kind of life stood and prayed beautiful words that were put in her mouth by the Holy Spirit that's praying in her. This is how she addressed the Mother of God. O Lady Mother of God, who gave birth in the flesh to God the Word, I know, oh how well I know, that it is no honor or praise to thee when one so impure and depraved as I 
Look up to thy icon, O ever virgin, who did keep thy body and soul in purity. Rightly do I inspire hatred and disgust before thy virginal purity. But I have heard that God, who was born of thee, became man on purpose to call sinners to repentance. Then help me, for I have no other help. Order the entrance of the church to be open to me. Allow me to see the venerable tree on which he who was born of thee suffered in the flesh and on which he shed his blood for the redemption of sinners and for me, unworthy as I am. Be my faithful witness before thy son that I will never again defile my body by the impurity of fornication. But as soon as I have seen the tree of the cross, I will renounce the world and its temptations, and I will go wherever thou will lead me. A woman who had been living in sin, who likely never opened the Gospels, was filled with such pure prayer. And from that place in her life, she goes on to dwell in the desert for 47 years, struggling against what is remaining of the passions. You know, because the passions don't just leave us. They keep their pull. They keep exercising their effect on us way after we entertain them. She struggled for many years to regain the purity of her soul and her body. This great saint reminds us that none of us are in too deep, that there is healing for whatever passion is consuming us. When we come to God in repentance, he is always ready to offer us forgiveness, and his mother and the saints are always praying for us and strengthening us. And we know that we need their prayers and that strength that comes from them. Because the road to healing is not easy. It is filled with many struggles. Because as I said, the passions don't leave us without first exercising a pull on us. They drag us down and often paralyze us in order to prevent us from moving forward. The world around us will never understand why a Christian would engage, would engage in such a spiritual life. You're okay, I'm okay, we're all okay. You don't need repentance because God accepts you just the way that you are. How often do we hear these kinds of lies? It is, forgive my, forgive my expression, it is pseudo-spiritual trash. By saying this, I don't mean to attack those who teach this, such, this kind of thing, often they are just trying to avoid the negative and self-destructive patterns associated with shame and wrong forms of guilt. But this is how the father of lies, the devil, that's how he works. Instead of telling us that there is a form of guilt that leads to healing through repentance. He instead tries to convince us that we no, don't need healing altogether and that all forms of guilt are bad. The world has collectively embraced this lie. And more than ever today, we need the witness of saints like St. Mary of Egypt to remind us that repentance is necessary. And the work of repentance is not easy. 
In fact, it can be quite painful because for the passions to leave us, we need to let go of our ego. And as we do that, it's painful. But as St. Paul says, God's grace is sufficient for us. And the saints and the scriptures reassure us that no matter how difficult it is, the Lord will always provide what is needed because the Lord offers himself. He offers his life. And when we purify ourselves, we have this opportunity to participate in his life. Now in today's gospel, we see the disciples struggling with one particular type of passion that was sowing divisions among them. It's the passion of love of authority. You know, during Great Lent, we are often praying the prayer of Saint Ephraim, where he asks God to free us or take away from us four different passions, and one of them is the spirit of lust of power. And when we're reading this gospel today, it strikes us as a very strange thing for two of these apostles to ask. The brothers, James and John, they come to ask him for places of authority. Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left hand in your glory. That's what it is. They're asking for places of authority. And it's a strange request because it's such a stark opposition to what had just come. The Lord taking his disciples and telling them, we're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles and they will mock him and spit upon him and scourge him and kill him and after three days he will rise. And this was not the first time that the Lord was talking to the disciples about his upcoming crucifixion, death, and resurrection. So how does one go from this to asking for a special place of authority? It's absurd. It's irrational. But this is precisely how sin works. Sin is irrational. If you allow me, I'm just going to take a little bit of a, a tangent. But it's very important for us to see that the scriptures do not hide those shortcomings and those failures of the disciples. One can imagine if an editor wanted to make the disciples and the early church look better, that they such an editor would have gone through the scriptures and taken out instances that reflect their weakness. But of course, that's not how the scriptures have been handed down to us. In last week's gospel, we read about how the disciples failed to heal the boy who was demon-possessed. And today, we're seeing how they're, they're just running into a futile dispute. You know, St. Mark says they were indignant that those two brothers were asking for such a thing. The scriptures do not hide these things. And the church was never troubled by something like that. St. John Chrysostom says, Let no man be troubled at the apostles being in such an imperfect state. For not yet was the cross accomplished, not yet was the grace of the Spirit given. End of tangent. When the Lord hears the request of James and John, he reminds them of the cross. He says, are you able to drink of the cup that I drink? or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am to be baptized. 
What is this cup? What is this baptism if it's not the cross? He is telling them and us, do you want the glory of the kingdom without the cross? I'm not going to Jerusalem as a glorious king. I'm going to the cross. And this is the problem with much of what we encounter in what I kind of described earlier, those pseudo-spiritual messages that we hear today. It's a Christianity without a cross. Today's gospel gives us the cure for that. When seeing the divisions among the disciples, the Lord says, this is how the world acts, but it shall not be so among you. The world is filled with division, but it shall not be so among you. The temptation to lord it over others is intoxicating, but it shall not be so among you. The desire to be better than others is strong, but it shall not be so among you. The tendency to abuse authority is addictive, but it shall not be so among you. If you want to be first, you must be the last. If you want to be great, you need to be the servant of all. After all, the Lord is saying, this is what I have done. For the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, with the exception of Judas, all the disciples will go on to understand this deep reality that in order to have any share in the Lord's ministry, in order to participate in his life, in order to become like him, they needed to do two things. They needed to renounce the world and at the same time to love and serve the world. This may sound like a paradox, but this is precisely what the gospel calls us to do today, here and now. And this is precisely why a Christianity without a cross just does not exist. The disciples understood that and all the saints inherently lived that. No matter how polluted was her life, St. Mary of Egypt understood the depth of this reality revealed to her in her heart when she prayed to the Theotokos, as soon as I have seen the tree of the cross, I will renounce the world and its temptations and will go wherever thou will lead me. When St. Zosimas met this great saint and heard her life, he was trembling. The life says, he was trembling and he was amazed. So let us join him as he offers praise to God, saying, truly, God did not lie when he promised that when we purify ourselves, we shall be like him. Blessed is God who creates the great and wondrous, the glorious and marvelous without end. Blessed is God who has shown me how he rewards those who fear him. Truly, O Lord, thou dost not forsake those who seek thee. Glory to God, who bestows great gifts upon those who love him. Amen.